of fundraising and equity. In part, because we have two awesome presenters. Christine Corso is the Research and Projects Coordinator for People for Education, where she oversees the annual survey and plays a crucial role in measuring what matters in the Prior to joining p e Christine earned her master's in teaching at Boise and spent multiple years as an educator. Today, she's going to play a crucial role in framing our discussion by pulling out some key insights from this year's survey and report, and also talking a bit about the context in which our data was collected. Our second presenter, Jackie Strong, is the Communications and Engagement Director for Angle for Education. Her role spans across everything ranging from author and reports, managing a number of stakeholder networks, and also planning some crucial events like our conference here today. In our session, Jackie is going to be digging into some tangible actions we can take to mitigate the inequity of the results as a result of runaway or extensive funders. Last and most certainly least, my name is Mike, and over the past year, I had the pleasure of being the lead author on the fundraising and fees section of People for Education. I had the pleasure of moderating our conversation at the end of this session, and I'm really excited to hear from all the insight that I'm sure this room is for. I know we have a number of experts present here today, so I'm hoping you'll take the opportunity to share your research. I know Sue is going to be speaking a bit for five minutes at the end. Uh, and just generally engaging in the discussion because I know that collectively we can deepen our understanding of this important topic. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Jack and Christine. And just to so you know, we really are going to be counting on your expertise yeah. when we open the discussion. We want to hear from you as much as you hear from us ideas and suggestions about how to increase that goal. Um, and before we get started, I'm going to take a leap from. Yes. Uh -oh. um, but I'm, I'm interested in, in who we have in the audience in front of us. So um, do we have uh, parents? Who here is a parent? Okay, wow. Awesome. <laughs> um, who here, who's here in a, their capacity as an educator? So a uh, principal, teacher, uh, district level. Okay, and then uh, do we have people who are involved in community, community organizations? Um, and everyone? Uh, what if, what if else? No, we're good. Okay. <laughs> That's great. We're good. Yeah, did we miss anybody? Stu, who's Stu, who's Um, Public health. Public health. Oh, great. Okay, so, um, as Mike pointed out, he is the, the author of our fundraising and fees chapter from last year, from our annual report, we're going to talk about that a little bit. But, I'm going to take you, and I don't have like a formal presentation or anything, I'm just, I just got a couple slides to keep me on track. Um, but fundraising is really where People for Education started, in a way. So, um, fundraising, or sorry, People for Education started from an idea that, well, any kidder and a group of parents were asked to fundraise one year, I think it was 1995 or 96, uh, for math textbooks for their child's school, and their children's school. And they were asked to fundraise for math test books, and they're like, wait, that doesn't sound right. That sounds like something that shouldn't be fundraised for. That sounds like something that should be provided for in the funding and the taxes that we pay. So they got to thinking, why are we fundraising for this? And they didn't, they didn't say, no, we won't do that. That's not right. Everyone should have math textbooks. They did actually fundraise for textbooks. But it got them thinking um, about what would happen if their community didn't have a lot of affluent people that could fundraise and had the means to fundraise for the textbooks that they needed, and what would happen in the school down the street. So they decided that as hard as they were going to work to fundraise for these textbooks, they were going to, they were going to work equally as hard to talk about how wrong this was that they had to fundraise for these textbooks. So that's where we started. And actually, and then, um, Sue can totally correct me if I'm wrong. Sue did some research on it. She, she works on, uh, in part, the impact of organizations like People for Education on policy and how that plays out. And so um, what we see now is we have fundraising guidelines and fee guidelines in the ministry um, that they put forward and partly in response to the, the, the heck that was raised by People for Education year over year talking about the ways that fundraising and fees were used in schools across Ontario. 
So um, now we have guidelines that say, for example, funds raised for school purposes are used to complement but not to replace public funding for education. We can't have fundraising for things like textbooks. There's, uh, you know, examples that are in the fundraising guidelines, but we now have rules about this, whereas before we had no rules. And um, similarly, fees for learning materials and activities. Every student has the right to attend school where, qualified, where they are a qualified resident pupil without the payment of a fee. So we now have these rules um, that are in place. Now, is it to say that fundraising is a bad thing? Like, absolutely not. Fundraising is, we're, we're not here saying that fundraising is, is evil. Um, in fact, many schools fundraise. It's ubiquitous. So we know that many schools fundraise because we do an annual, we can do an annual survey, and as Mike said, is opening. That's that's my project. That's what I take care of at uh, People for Education. So, what we do is every fall we have um, we send out a survey across Ontario to all of our all of our schools. There's there are four thousand seven hundred, you know, some odd ones. <laughs> I, mean, I think it was 57 actually. Okay. So um, this year we sent out our survey to 4,757 schools, and of those we get about 20% response rate from principals, and they answer questions about all sorts of things. Um, so we follow, we have regularly recurring questions about about areas like fees and fundraising. We also ask questions about arts education, we ask questions about um, the uh, the qualifications of specialist teachers that you have in the classroom, we ask about psychologists and access to educational assistance, all sorts of things. Um, but we definitely have been asking since the beginning, I'm going to grab my notes because I want to make sure that I got all my notes. Oh yeah, right here. Cool. So since the beginning we've been asking though about fees and fundraising. Um, and we ask this of all schools, so not just English public schools, but all publicly funded schools spanning English, French, Catholic, and non-Catholic. So 98% of elementary schools and 85% of secondary schools last year reported that they fundraise. So everyone's doing it. It's like not a bad thing. We're not saying it's a bad thing at all. What we are what we're wondering, what we're posing to this group is what are we fundraising for and what what is the what is the utility of fundraising in a system where we have publicly funded schools, and how can it be the most helpful? So um, these are two quotes from last year's survey. So one here, we have an active school community and the parents support events and academics in the school. We've used fundraising money to build our technology library, laptops, Chromebooks, and iPads. So that's one principal responded last year. This is another principal. Servicing a low socioeconomic area makes it challenging to meet the needs of students in all required areas of programming. Nutrition is costly and fundraising efforts are insignificant. So those are two principals last year that wrote in to us and said this is what the biggest challenge that we're facing in fundraising or this is our biggest area of success. And I pulled out those two quotes because they kind of characterize the differences in the type of the type of initiatives that are fundraised for across the province. So there is a difference between fundraising to build up your technology library, to put iPads um, into the hands of students so that they can have a really wonderful experience in their classroom, which is awesome. I, I was a teacher in a school in Edmonton that had uh, Chromebook carts. It was amazing. We were in Google Classroom and we had really, really engaging lessons and we were able to do a lot with our with the students' critical literacy because they were able to grab resources from online, that's awesome. But then we look also at schools that are trying to put together breakfast programs. We heard last year from schools that are trying to provide clothing for um, for families because they have parents that are out of work and they're trying to support their communities. So we have just this huge like disparity in what's going on in Ontario. And yeah, so it just, it just kind of makes you think about what's going on. So, this is, this is where it just, this really hit me when Christine and Michael started talking about this. Because it says, you know, one group is fundraising for the nice things. And like, they're saying, the other group is saying, we can't even fundraise for the basic, bare essentials to support needy kids. So that, it's a really shocking thing to 
And they're, they're talking about the required areas of programming, and that's the type of thing that, like, that, that's why we have fundraising guidelines. Like, you're not supposed to even have to require uh, fundraise for the required areas of programming. So, like, that should be covered by by our funding. Um, and, then, and then we can have a whole conversation about equity and, and funding and the learning opportunities. Another workshop, but anyways. Um, so, going back to these fundraising guidelines, we. As I said, there are guidelines about what you should and shouldn't be fundraising for because logic would have it that your funding that's provided by the government will cover certain things. But even though our fundraising guideline says that we should not be um, we should not be replacing public funding, we see that when we ask the question, does your school, this is exactly how we ask it, does your school, parents, students, and their staff fundraise for learning resources? Yeah. yeah, like some of them do. So they're, they're still fundraising for learning resources in some cases. Uh, last year, those are the stats from last year, so 48% of elementary schools and 10% of secondary schools are fundraising for learning resources. And then fees for learning materials and activity guidelines, if you would say, that goes to secondary school or, um, you know, that, that it's very common that we have student activity fees in our secondary schools. Not to say that this is you know, required for programming, but the way it's communicated often uh, to children, and we have parents, and we had a parent who called us like last week <laughs> talking about this. She was like, they're withholding my student's card like, because she hasn't paid her fee and we don't know what to do. Like, many schools have these required student activity fees. And yes, the, uh, the other part of this is we ask the question, what happens when a, a child or a family can't afford these fees? They're waived in many cases, absolutely. But there are still student activity fees, that's supplemental funding to the funding that comes from the province and that is needed in order for that, what the school's communicating is we need that extra money in order to operate the way that we do right now. So on average, about $35 uh, for a student activity fee, but they go up to $100. Um, so in 2013, we were able to take our demographic uh, data and link it up with our school survey data where we did that into postal codes of the schools, the postal codes uh, from demographic data to fam average family income from that area. We lined them up and then we looked at how does fundraising match up with the average income in that postal code area. We can see that we had a really strong correlation. Wow. So on the bottom, we've got um, deciles of, of average income. So we've broken up into tenths. And, um, and then going up, we have the average amount that was fundraised by the school. So when we compare over here, in our bottom decile, we have like around 5,000. And then in our top decile, we have about 25,000. So about five times more money is fundraised by that top decile of income. In the bottom decile. So, you know, we're, and that I mean, this all follows to logic. We could have we could have probably drawn that graph, like if we if we sat down and talked about it for two seconds. But it's interesting to see the data there. Um, and this also plays out in our regional data. So our regional data we break down the, into like five large regions across the province. So northern Ontario is huge. It's obviously the largest part of Ontario. Eastern Ontario. Um, Southwestern Ontario, the GTA, and then Central Ontario, which is kind of like Georgian Bay and then the Bay Area kind of area. So every, everything not including the GTA that's in Central Ontario. Um, but we can see that, again, there's like that discrepancy, that regional difference between the GTA earning, or uh, sorry, raising about $9,000 per school. This is median, not, not mean, but, um, and Northern Ontario with only 5000 so just that these differences continually play out over and over, it's, um, it's just something to keep in mind. So when we think about those quotes from those schools, and we think about the, what uses these the, the funds that are raised are going to, we have schools that are generally in certain areas of lower income. We have certain regions that are rural, and we have different uses for the funds there. So what can we do that would, that would help everyone in the province? Um, Another thing is that our fundraising gap between the top and bottom uh, fundraisers is widening. So we've collected data for a long time on fundraisers, and this is just looking at elementary schools, so I'll explain this later. What we did is we stratified all the elementary schools by how much they fundraised. So from $0 all the way up to like 
you know, hundred thousand dollars in the top. And and last year some elementary schools raised hundred thousand dollars. So we stratified them, we cut them into deciles, like ten percent, and we compared the top and bottom ten percent about how much in total they raised. So for every for every dollar that was raised by that bottom decile, that bottom ten percent, in two thousand eight the top ten percent raised twenty five dollars. For every dollar raised in the bottom ten percent, the top ten percent raised twenty five dollars. This year, we almost doubled that. So this year, um, for every dollar raised by the bottom ten percent, the top ten percent raised forty nine dollars. So not only do we have that trend that follows income, but the gap between the fundraising efforts of lower um, fundraising schools and higher fundraising schools is widening. Okay, so. All of that to say, though, that again, fundraising is not, it's not an evil practice, it's not a problem um, in and of itself, but it's just like where, where, do we, where do we have to be explicit about what the problem is, or what, where the problem does exist? Like what, what problem is here actually? So this, this session is equity and fundraising, but it doesn't actually pose a specific question, it's just kind of, what's, like, what's going on here, what are we gonna do about it? Um, and that's also why we're, we're going to have a big discussion about this. Yeah. So I'm going to hand over, those are all my, my facts and figures, I'm going to hand it over to Jackie, and then we're going to chat about this. She does the facts other than this. Just one question yes. oh, yeah. We're talking about fundraising. It's not like we're fundraising for Terry Fox and the money's going to Terry Fox. Oh, we're talking uh -huh. about fundraising, or, or are we? And that's what so, we're doing. Like, this is fundraising for my school that we're going to use at my school for stuff for our school. Okay, so that's actually a very good question. So when we ask the question, we we just state fundraising, like how how many funds we raised last year, and um, and it's been it's been kind of in in years past we've asked specific questions about how much money do you raise for charity, how much money do you raise for this that the other, and we do often ask like what type of fundraising are you doing? Are you doing it for sports equipment or arts? Or what are you doing it for? Um, but Inevitably, we have confusion among uh, principals about what exactly qualifies as fundraising and what doesn't. And so, when we when we ask that question, and that's a, the, actually like a very good point because going forward with our survey, we're looking at rewording the question to divide it up into multiple parts. But um, we we just ask in general fundraising. So these reports, it's just fundraising. But, yeah, fundraising in general. Yeah. So if they if your school, uh, yeah, yeah, fundraising in general. So whatever purpose it so is. So could include both. Could, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Both the school and like both the school fundraising and parent health fundraising sort of all together. Yes, and that's like how how much money do you do you fundraise as like a school community? Mm -hmm. Not like not does your school charge for field trips or anything like that? Like it's like how how much money do you fundraise in general? Mm -hmm. 